Right, so I'm going to be introducing our guest for tonight. So, our first guest was born in New Zealand and joined the Wigan Warriors back in 2007. He started his professional rugby league career in May, tw- May 2003, making his NRL debut for the New Zealand Warriors and becoming the youngest ever player to play for the club. After becoming a World Cup winner with the Kiwis in 2008, he went on to win his first trophies at club level, winning 2010 League Leader Shield and the Super League Grand Final, as well as the Harry Sunderland Trophy following his Man of the Match display against St Helens. In his, in his 12 seasons with Wigan, he played 325 games, scoring 74 tries and winning eight major honours. Since handing, up, since handing up his boots in 2022, he joined, the, he joined the Warriors as an assistant coach and he's recently signed an incredible seven-year extension with the club. Put your hands together and welcome our Tommy Lou the Wilder, number 997. Warriors legend and has played 457 games for the club. After joining Wigan's academy from St Pat's, he made his first team, de- first team debut at the club against Hull FC in April 2002. At age 24, he was handed the Wigan captaincy and four years later led the club to its first major titles in eight years, winning the League Leaders Shield and the 2010 Super League Grand Final. In total, he collected one World Club Challenge, four Super League titles, two Challenge Cups, three League Leader Shields, as well as being named a Super League Dream Team, a, a record of seven times. In 2020, he announced his retirement from playing on the field after 19 years for his hometown club. From this point, we saw him switch from player to assistant coach, at which he also recently signed a seven-year deal at the club. Please give a Riverside as welcome to Heritage number 947, Sean Lockley, Obrian. You probably need to speak up a little bit. Right, good evening gents. Thank you very much for coming. It's absolutely lovely to have you here. Um, So we're going to start off this evening, um, because we couldn't really start it off any other way, than talking about Bevan's new contract. What's your views on that? How pleased were you to hear that? Yeah, um, I suppose like everyone really just grateful that he's signed. <laughs> um, he's a special player, Bev, and um, I know he would have had a lot of interest and in a lot of clubs chasing him would love to have him, but um, for us to have him in our team and in our club, I think it's not just what he does on the field, it's what he brings to the, to the town and to the club, so um, yeah, we're extremely excited. I uh, feel privileged to coach him, he's a special player, and um, yeah, I think just like everyone else, we're really happy to have him. What's your views on that, Sean? Uh, very similar. He's- what he does on the field is kind of that goes without saying, but um, I think he's everything the club wants as a player as well. The way the way he represents the club himself, his family, um, and it's it's just great to have one of the guys that come up from Australia um, and New Zealand who want to be here and want to want to be here for for a long time and commit to that. And you can start building teams around them. And it's, there's no question about what he can brings on the field, but his, his kind of attitude, how he influences the team is. He's awesome, and, and yeah, he got me and Tommy a contract off the back of it as well. <laughs> so have you tipped him for that? <laughs> right, so we're going we're gonna to just take it back a little bit um, and just touch on the World Club Challenge, obviously, because it's such, a, such an amazing achievement for the club again. So it's your wor- first World Club Challenge as coaches. What was that like compared to being a player? Um, they're both enjoyable. Um, obviously, I think a little bit more work goes into the coaching side of things than um, as a player. Um, a lot of preparation. I remember we um, started getting clips on Plymouth around Christmas time, really, just to have a look at it. So, me, Maddie, and Lockers really, you know, thought it was a big game and we really wanted to um, pull all we could into it. So, a lot of preparation went into it and it was a fantastic night for the club and for the town. Um, just really enjoyable. It was a great game of rugby. And it was a pleasure to be part of, really. What's your take on that, Sean? 
Yeah, similar. There's, there's a lot of work kind of behind the scenes, but we didn't want to kind of put too much pressure on the lads as well. We didn't want to, we didn't really mention too much pre-season up to the back end. You obviously want to get your friends out of the way and you, you want to start the season well, so you don't want it. As long, I think the lads know it's there, but you don't want to make too much of it. So like when you're coming up to a final and people get a bit worried about getting injured, but we wanted to start the season. Um, so cast was like a really important game, so we didn't want to make too much of it, but then once the week came, uh, uh, probably a few weeks prior to it, it started to get drip fed in a little. The lads started talking about it a little bit more, but it was just just a great build up, a great occasion, a privilege to be a part of as a, as a staff as much as as a player. It was it was great to see the boys go out there and, and do a job on it. And for us, it's a bit different because well, we're not as kind of clued up on some of the players. Obviously, some of the big names you know, but um, you've got to do your own work on them and kind of present that to the lads and make sure they're up to speed with everything as well. So it was. I was chuffed for them that they got the win because it was, I just thought they, they deserved it, they, they, they put everything into it, they, it was a real commitment and and the kind of occasion what the club had, club had made of it, selling it out kind of months before, it was it was just a very special night to be part of. So talk us through your World Club Challenge day, what was it like obviously leading up to the game? <laughs> was it was it quite a chill day for you, or was it were you running around making sure everything was organised? Uh, no, we. I think our weeks kind of in any week for for me and Tommy it's kind of from the from the previous game it's hectic up until about Tuesday or Wednesday and then it kind of chills down to the game day. Then. So we kind of get the work into the lads early. We get all the info we want to get into them, and, and then our last practice game for was it Saturday game? Saturday. Our last practice would have been on the on the Thursday, so our our probably last involvement with the lads would have been where we, where we sat down ch chatting rugby was Wednesday, and then we get on the field and practice all that Thursday. So it's very chill after that. Um, so was it just a lot of coffees after that? Yeah, it was. It was a I won't say sleepless night, but butterflies in the belly, and mm -hmm. it's it's not the same. I don't get the nerves as a player, and just the same nerves as a player because it's almost. It's handed over to them. It's them who's going delivering it, um, but you also get a different feel that like it's a bit out of your control as well. You, you want, you've done everything you can do, and then it's on the boys to go out there and deliver, which they did. So, what was your day like, Tommy? Was yours pre-chilled? Yeah, Coffee? Pretty, yeah, pretty similar. I didn't do too much in the morning. Um, it's exactly what Locker said. There, our, our work's done during the week, really. So, yeah, I don't get nervous to say, like similar to playing, not similar to Locker's. It's a lot different to playing, but I suppose first... Is it, is it kind of a different type of nerves? Yeah, it is because it's how you control it. It's not something you, you know, as, as a player, you've still got the game to come and you know you can influence it where we have a little bit of say, I suppose, around game day and getting subs right and things like that, but ultimately it's all handed over to them. So I know that week in preparation, I was quite confident that, not the result, but I was confident that we'd play well. Yeah. You know, and sometimes the result's out of your hands, so... Yeah, I was confident we'd play well, we prepared really well, so, yeah, wasn't really nervous, but then just the atmosphere that, you know, it was, it was like across there, and, you know, the, the week and the build-up, was just a, a special game to be part of. So there is talk of the World Cup Challenge being taken to Las Vegas. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sounds good. Um... <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, sounds good. Um, look, I, I seen what the NRL done last year, the first round going there. It makes sense, I suppose, to, 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 to meet there and, and play. I think it'd be a great occasion. And yeah, I think, especially with the NRL, I looking to do the first round over there again. I think it'd be great for fans to come over, watch that game, but also watch some other rugby league. It makes sense. So, what about you, Lockers? Are you ready for a trip to Vegas? No, I'm not too keen, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. There was actually a chat last about it being this one being there. I think when, when, it first up, when we first knew. It was going ahead, there was a bit of conversation around it again, so we was, we was pushing hard for it to be over there, but it did come off. Um, <laughs> but it would be awesome, I think. For, well, you, you, watch what, you watch what that first round of NRL was like and the publicity that got. Um, I think it'd be awesome for our game to, to latch on to that and be a part of. Um, uh, by all accounts, there was probably as many English fans over there as there was American fans, uh, sorry, Australian fans, so it's, it does definitely be an appetite for it from over here. So yeah, I, I think it'd be great. So Tommy, um, just thinking about the World Cup Challenge game, uh, that set play from the scrum um, that Bevan was pulled off for offside, 
There was talk that it was a Tommy Lulawai inspired move. But we, we had Harry Smith there last month and he was doing his best to claim it as his own. Okay. Yeah, he can have it, he can have it. Um, look, with, with all our players, it's a group decision. It's not just myself. Um, you know, Locke is included. We all have different ideas. Um, we did speak about that, I think, a, a week before. Just, you know, the opportunity of it arose. And we had to be the, the right point in the field and the play and the feet of the scrum had to be on the right side so Harry could kick off his left foot. So it all sort of fell into place, but I'll, I'll let Harry take that. Yeah. So how, how much influence or input do you have in Harry's development as a player? Um, I suppose because we play the same position. Um, you know, I suppose a little bit more input than most probably. Um, myself, I also played alongside Harry. So I've seen him come right through, uh, you know, I've seen him come right through the grades and yeah, I'd like to think I've had a, an impact, but you know, I think he's been he's had a fantastic year. Um, he's developing really well. Um, his understanding of the game is, is very high for his age. He understands the game really well. And um, you know, I still think the best is yet to come from Harry, I honestly do. You know, he's developing, he, he's he's most probably gonna be one of our leaders now and, and that's a I think a key key process as a halfback when you get that role and you step up into leadership role sort of helps your game all around because ultimately he's the guy telling us where to go on the field so you know I think he's done a great job and you know I, I do think the best is yet to come. So how are you both enjoying your coaching roles? Yeah I am learning a lot I'm obviously really new to it um, I um, yeah, jumped straight out of playing so I didn't do much too much coaching around that so it's all new to me really just learning and I'm enjoying it um, I enjoy the, the place we work with the people I work with that makes a big difference. We all get along, um, and it's just yeah, it's a great bunch of a great environment to be in. I think Matt has created a real close knit environment, but a, an environment where it's about the town and about people buying into that and the people from the town. So I enjoy working there, and just every day you just continue learning. What about you, Sean? Uh, yeah, very similar. Uh, on, on that Harry Smith tour, it was it was Tommy's up. Yeah. <laughs> it's too modest, isn't he? <laughs> There's a, there's a, there's a doc, the documentary team, I remember, was they were more wounded than, than us when the, the kick didn't come off because they, they were in the meeting what, what we had when, when Tommy like, put it on the plate, I'll have a crack at this, and the chat around it was, uh, we're, what if we're up, what if we're down, and we he pretty much just said, if we're on the right spot, whatever point, if we're up down, we'll, we'll, we'll have a crack at it, and we did, we didn't get the points, but they thought it would have made great TV, and they were, they were gutted. That's because it's better, it's too fast. <laughs> Yet uh, the coaching side of things, yeah, I mean, I mean, enjoying the, the work and the job, but probably the biggest thing is is the environment, the people we're, we're working with. Me, and Matty, and Tommy have a, as much as we, we we do all our work, we have a, we have a, a great laugh on, on a daily basis, and I think that's that's probably the most important thing. We enjoy what we're doing, enjoying each other's company. Matty keeps us on our toes, and he's he's been around the coach and seen a lot longer than we have. Um, so we we probably got bits of knowledge from being on the field, um, what we can bring to the game. The coaches side of things, Matt has been around it a lot longer than us, so we're learning off that, off him daily. Um, but yeah, it's it's just very silly things. Like you, you just enjoy the uh, the silly parts of the day, the fun parts of the day with the lads, with the coaching staff. That's that probably what makes the environment just as good as the kind of. The high performance side of things as well, that enjoyment. And if, I think if we didn't have that, it'd be, it, it would be a tough job because you, your week is very busy. You, you do get a lot on your plate from one day to the next and then you get time to chill. But yeah, that, that enjoyment factor is huge for us. So do you miss not putting your boots on when it's these big games like the World Cup Challenge and the Grand Final? Um, no, not anymore. <laughs> Me and, me, and, me and Tommy played in, the, in Dubai Sevens at Christmas. Um, well, you, Tommy was all right, I was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I hurt my shoulder, I never hurt my shoulder in 20 years playing, I hurt my shoulder. So I'm definitely done. What about you, Tommy? Do you miss it? No, I don't. I don't. Um, I think when I retired, I knew it was time. So, yeah, there hasn't been really too many games that I've thought, um, you know, I'd want to be out there and I'd, I'd back up lockers. We, I've tried, I think, two games after I finished playing. I've done it twice and yeah, you always go with the best intention thing, it's gonna be a lot of fun, but the body hurts for weeks after and, uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, we had a, 
<laughs> you know, we went over to the Dubai Sevens and everyone thought we had a really good team. Well, we did have a really good team, but we were quite old. And then, um, yeah, we all played. Ryan Hoffman played, Pat Richards played, and me and Lockers. And I think, by far, I think Pat was the worst out of the four of us. Um, yeah, he's not as fast as he used to be. He looks like it, but it doesn't move as quick. And um, yeah, we had a good laugh, though. It was funny, but um, I think, yeah, I don't think we chucking the boots on again for a run around is going to happen. I think we got asked the other day, didn't we? Do something, but yeah, I played touch, but the body hurts too much after after the game. It's, it's, it's crazy what you think you put your body through for so long, but then you if you don't do it if you don't do it often and you try to jump back in, it absolutely kills you. So um, now I'm, I'm well and truly done. So. Do the two of you, do your roles differ on match days? Because obviously, Sean, you're, you're, you tend to be a bit more on the field and involved with the players, whereas you tend to sit with Matt on the gantry. Yeah, I'm sitting with Matt, passing messages down and, and just seeing stuff that we're doing. And I pass messages down to Lockers and he, he relays them to the team, so that's pretty much how it works. Um, yeah, we just, if we see stuff, we, we, we pass those messages down, it's most probably, and Lockers is most probably just getting a feel for the boys and seeing how they are and then relaying that back to us so it's um you know you're constantly learning out there but it's um can be intense especially if um, the game's tight especially with maddie next year yelling but um i think it's important to stay calm and try to get the right messages back back to the lads so are you sending the messages down getting him to run around on the field keeping him fit <laughs> yeah, 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 like how easy did you both find it in the transition from player to coach um I wouldn't say easy, it was challenging, but it was good. I, I remember speaking to Lockers about it before I jumped in. I didn't know whether to jump straight in and have a crack or bide my time and wait. And he sort of convinced me to look, it's, it's a jump anyway, you know, whether you take a couple of years helping out with scholarship and then jumping into it, he said it's still, it's still a challenge. So he convinced me to jump in. And then yeah, when I jumped in, it was for long. <laughs> I said, cheers, Lockers. Um, but it was for long, but yeah, I feel like you learn quickly, you just you get on with it. Obviously, the rugby side of things have been playing so long. Knowing the game is one thing, but I think what Locker said before, Maddie's coached for a long time, so actually learning how to coach and how to get your message across, you know, is something that, you know, I'm learning a lot. So I love that, picking up on that, but it was challenging. It's different, the hours are a lot different. Um, but I said, I'm just glad I got straight into something instead of waiting around for a couple of years, waiting to have a crack, I just jump straight in and uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Uh, yes, similar, I, don't, I think me and Tommy both same as in, we've probably got the most out of our career as well. I think some lads what have it cut short and then have to make that transition when it's a bit forced on them, they, they probably struggle with it a little bit more. But I felt like, well, I, I in particular, I had a couple of years where I was coming and I whether to make that decision or not. Um, so by the time I made it, I was, I was kind of ready for it. Um, so the actual stepping away from rugby was, wasn't was wasn't difficult as in not being on the pitch. Um, but I do think when you go into it, you stay in the environment, I think that, that obviously you're still part of this kind of what you've been a part of for a long time. So you still feel you still feel that connection with it. Um, and I think the transition of coming off the field was, was all right. I, I, no, um, no problems at all. Uh, I didn't miss, miss the rugby side of things. But I, I can imagine if I'd gone away, I'd do something completely different. I'd have missed, I'd have missed the kind of team environment being around that. Yeah. That, that would be something what I, th I feel like I'd, I'd well, definitely make something, well, something we've done for 20 years plus. So I think to just go away from that and do something completely different, that, that, would, be, that would be probably more difficult. So, Mike Danson, who obviously now owns both the Warriors and the Latics, We've seen some of the Wigan Connects events. Is there anything going on behind the scenes um, with the coaching staff working together or like any shared learning or anything like that? With, with Latix, uh, we've not done yet. We've, I know um, some, of the, some of the staff have been over here and we've bobbed over there a few times, but we've used, been using the Christopher Park facility. Uh, but there is a few things on the card to kind of go sit down and actually spend some time with each other. At the minute, it's just been observing and, um, and just almost coming, they've, they've become much fewer on match days. Some of the SNC coaches have, have um, shared ideas, shared things, uh, and there's a few, there's a few staff coming. Well, 
there's a sports psychologist what's coming recently who's, who's doing bits with both sides of things, so I think there'll be more, more scope for things like that. But uh, from a coaching point of view, it is something on the cards, but we want to go, it's hard to just go and watch training and you, you probably have to sit down and have some time, we have some conversations, but it's pretty, their, their, their fixtures come thick and fast more than I was doing, so it's, to finding that time, that slot in the diary is quite tough, but definitely it's something what I think will start happening more and more. Is that something you're looking forward to, Tommy? <laughs> yeah, just learning, really. It'd be great to get involved. Like I said, it is quite tough at the moment because of time and schedules, but any chance you can get to see different environments, you know, I'm open to, and I know we both are, and, and just try to pick up different things. I've jumped in and had a few Zooms with different coaches, and you always come away with something. So, you know, we're continually looking to learn to see how we can improve to hopefully make us a better team. Uh, how challenging is it from a coaching perspective to prepare the players to adapt to all the new rules? Yeah, it is challenging. It's been a challenging start to the year for the game, I think, just with the rules. Um, I think next year it's naturally going to be more challenging, but we understand why they're doing it and we support that. But um, yeah, it is it is hard. I think it's hard for the refs too. So, um, you know, we're doing our best. I think some games we've, you know, most probably haven't been too good at it. It's most probably put us under a lot of pressure, but I think we've, we've coped with it well, but it's definitely something we're continuing to try to get better at. I think a, a lot of clubs are the same. Um, yeah, look, I don't want to be too critical. Um, we're all in the same boat. We're trying to make the game better. We're trying to make it safer for our players. Um, it's just the, the way it is at the moment. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next one. How are you planning to manage the reduced number of games that players, and in particular forwards, are allowed to play? Yeah, I'm, Is it 22 games? Yeah, I think it'll work out that. I don't think it'll be as hard as, as, as it sounds. I think, you know, I think we look to give players a rest anyway, especially, you know, we don't want everyone playing all the games and all the minutes. So, yeah, look, I think the way it's worked out, I think, you know, if you miss maybe one game where you give them a bit of rest that they can you know, things so yeah it's not I don't think it's going to be as challenging as what people think I think you know we have a lot of injuries you look at suspensions now people are missing a lot of games so the rotation of squads and having really good squads is is key at the moment I think teams that have a lot of depth and good young players coming through can sort of handle these times and we've lost two guys this week and you know, we've got two new guys coming in and, and we're confident they can do the job and I think you know, we're in a good spot in, in terms of our squad and our depth so I don't think it's going to be as challenging as everyone thinks, I don't think. Do you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, it's, I think from last year's fixtures and out time, I think there was only two lads it would have affected. I think one of them was Harry Smith, who played in all the England small games as well. So it's, uh, the way we've been told, it's, it shouldn't affect you too much, it shouldn't affect too many players. Um, and if it, if it got to the point where they, they were full uh, on the time or the game time, it wouldn't be a you can't play next week, it would be, you've got to filter that into next season, they might have missed two games next year where it might have only been one, so it's not going to be a regimented set in stone things where you could get to a grand final and someone can't play, it, for instance, something like that, it won't, it won't work in that manner. Right, so um, you've both recently been awarded the seven year deals, tell us how that came about, how easy was the decision to put pen to paper? Um, it was, it, it just, well, I, um, I think he was still in, he still had a year left, Matty still had, I think Matty only just signed a new one. Um, I was uh, finished at the end of this one, so my man ran out at the end of this year. Um, and Rad, I think Rad's approach was all on the same day, but individually, and said that, about, mentioned it about um, a long term, he didn't mention seven years, he just said long term, so it was only a bit. A couple of days later, she said seven years, but it, it, for me, um, I'm very, <clears throat> very happy here. Um, I like kind of the environment. Um, I feel like I'm learning a lot. I think you could go different places and, and feel different environments, but I feel like I'm challenged and I feel like I'm in a place where the, the people above me are, um, expect a lot of me and I feel like that kind of, that pressure brings, brings more out of me. And, um, I know, I know I'm developing here week on week and year by year, so it's, it's, it's a great environment to be in. So when Rad said about four years, I was, uh, sorry, about seven years, I was, it was a no-brainer no for me. Uh, 
the only thing we spoke about with Brad's and I think Tommy had a similar conversation was for me it was um, I don't want to become staley. I don't want to I don't want to be a too long um, so that the conversation we had were just about the time and, and the money of the contract it was about developing and like them actively finding stuff for me to go and do at different clubs um, Hopefully over in Australia, places like that. <laughs> 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 that, was a, that was a result there anyway. And I'm not going back to a football club, something like that. No wonder you signed it so quickly. <laughs> no, but it was that, that was kind of, that development side of things and Rad's kind of bringing that up and saying he wants us to go and look at other sports, look at other environments, other work, other work environments. And I think with Mike connections, it's something what, it can open some doors what we, we might not have got in. So I think as a coaching, a coaching group for us to kind of um, have that opportunity to do things away from here as well. Um, that was that was something what was a real positive to have because hopefully we go away, we, we become better coaches, and we bring that back to to this environment, and it benefits everyone here as well. Yeah, very similar. I was, you know, the length of the deal and and all those sort of things wasn't as important as that stuff that Locker spoke about on. I was obviously straight into coaching, so very new. I had a year to go, but um, I thought about it's like, where else would I want to be, you know, to get challenged, and I'm at a good club. So, you know, my kids are at school, and I didn't want to move, so it all sort of fit, and that sort of thing. And then, like I said there, the, the main thing was about learning and becoming better. Seven years is a long time, isn't it? And, um, you know, I don't want to want to make sure I'm improving myself every day and, and, and going away and seeing different environments. And I think when Rats posed that to me, it made me feel, you know, you know, a lot it made it really easy, really, because that's the main thing. Um, yeah, um, the length of the deal and, and the money that wasn't as important as the challenging, because the last thing, like, like I said, we don't want to be, we've been here for a long time as players, it's become stale and, and don't grow. So, you know, so we thought, you know, when he put that to us, it, was, um, it made it quite, um, quite easy for me. And, and um, you know, like, I, I know I've got a lot to learn. So for me, seven years is, it's not, it's plenty of time for me to, to develop as a coach and I'm, I'm in no rush really. So we're just going to look back over the last couple of games, uh, starting off with the London game which we won 60 points to 22. Uh, there was a few changes to the team and a first debut of the season handed to Jack Farrimond. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um... A challenging game, I think, going down there against him, especially after two games we'd had before. But um, we thought it was a good time to, to give some you guys a crack. Um, Jack was one of them. I thought he had a fantastic game for a day before young kid. He's obviously going to be a special player for our club, and we've got a job of managing him and, and getting the best out of him when we need to. And um, you know, I'm pretty sure that he'll have a big future at the club, and it's, it's, it's I suppose, our job to make sure that um, we nurture him along and make sure he's um, you know, developing every day. So Sean, how pleasing is it to see yet another academy player break into the first team? Yeah, it's, I think as much as you see the top end of boats like, like Bev signing long, long term deals, um, I think we're a club what prides ourselves on young kids coming through as well. And I, I've seen Jack play from being about 11 years old and he's, he, was always, he was always a player what um, People spoke about him at that age as, as being, being, being the gun, and he, he's, he's come through, he's, he's been doing it for the academy. Um, he's come full time now, and he's, he's, he's just great to have, have around the environment. He's, um, he's got an old head on young shoulders. He's, he's, I think he's been um, brought up at, uh, in Lee, Lee Manor's rugby club, so he's, he's pretty smart. Um, but he's, he, it is, it's, it's, very, it's very nice when you, especially, I think from a coaching point of view, Probably different because a player you, you love to kind of then lads come in and get an opportunity to play alongside them, and it's slightly different now you see the progression progression of them as, as coaching side of things. Um, and then for them to get the opportunities, it's, it's good to see them get it there and enjoy it. So, how good was it to see Harvey Hill grabbing a couple of tries as well? He seems to have settled into the first team really well. Yeah, he is. He's um, yeah, very surprised to see him score a couple of tries. It's not, they don't go on and get too many, but. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's again. He's a great kid around the place, and he's he had a taste of it last year. He, he got some first team, um, quite a bit of first team rugby last year, um, and he's a bit Tommy Lee. He's he trains the house down. He, he, he gives everything every session. He works hard. He works on his game, 
and he's probably, we was bringing a few new props in, he's probably, he's probably a bit disappointed, like Tom knocks him down the order a little bit, but whenever he's come in, he's, he's, he's given his all, he's, he's added something to us, and uh, it might not be in week in, week out, but I know he'll do everything away from, um, away from matches when he's in training to, to get himself back in, and his, his attitude's bang on. So Tommy, as a former London Broncos player, how good is it to see London back in Super League? Yeah, it is. Um, I had a great time down there. I was very young when I was there and I enjoyed it. There's a few familiar faces too when I was there, which was surprising to see them still there. But um, yeah, look, it's, like, I'd love for them to be a lot stronger, to be honest with you. I feel like they've moved about six or seven times since I played down there, which I don't think helps. So hopefully they can have a base there that, that sticks. And I think, I don't know, the game would most probably benefit with having a team in London, but I think it would be benefit more having a competitive team in London, if you know what I mean. I'm not taking any discredit in them at the moment. I know they're trying their best to, you know, they're obviously working under different circumstances, but um, I think if we can get a really good team down in London, it'll only help our game. Lockers, is it true that Mr Lennigan tried to sign you for London Broncos? He did, did, yeah. Did. I met him in the Bellingham Hotel and it was, well, it was only a few years before he bought Wigan, actually. In 2007 he bought Wigan. I reckon it was about 2004 or five. Yeah, yeah, I met him over there, tried to sign him. I was just negotiating with Wigan so far, I'd be good to have a, have a backup. <laughs> <laughs> I, was never, I was never going to London. And were you one of his first signings for Wigan from London when he, when he bought Wigan? No, I had signed before he had bought uh, Wigan and yeah, he wasn't too happy about that, I think. I might have been the first one you want to sack, I think, if he, if he had his way. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a rocky start for me and Ian, but towards the end we are become best friends. So, just moving on to Salford, obviously we won that 22 points to 12. Um, they proper had their tails up after beating St. Helens. They put on a very spirited performance and pushed us until a rather bizarre decision to go for the short drop-off. What did you make of that? Yeah, I was grateful you did that, to be honest. Um, yeah, it was a different one. It's the way they play. They, they attack and they attack from anywhere. And I suppose it's their, their philosophy on how they want to play their game. So I, I back them for sticking to that in that moment, if you know what I mean. Like, coach comes in and he has a way they want to play. And, you know, it's very strong. And, and I, I thought it was a, obviously it didn't go to plan, but I like the thinking behind it. But obviously, um, you were quite lucky there and Jake Water got over. Well, he caught everybody off guard, including his own players, didn't he? Yeah, it was, um, like I say, a weird decision. We, we definitely wouldn't do that. It's not the way we, we, we sort of see the game panning out. But I do commend guys, teams that stick to how they want to play. And regardless of whether it's games on the line, they still trust what they're about. So I like that about it. What did you make of it, Shaw? I was just chuffed if he went for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I can't I don't get me everyone what you win in the games, what rules are left, like six, six, five minutes. Get the ball far away as, as you can. Uh, but yeah, definitely grateful I did it. So just moving on to the Sheffield game. Um, it's, it's just so hard to tune into any Challenge Cup game without hearing about Sheffield's 1998 win. It's like... <laughs> um, Obviously, they were very well drilled as well. They came at us. What would you make of that game? I was, I wouldn't say surprised, but I was, I was kind of, I thought they did a, a real good job. They were, like I said, they were very organised. They were, and they had, they had, from the team we'd previewed, there was a few, few individuals missing as well. So they, they, they were probably gone down the pecking order a little bit and some of the individuals they had in. But yeah, I thought they gave a great account to themselves. Um, it was just, it was a straight, not a hangover, but, when you when you play at the stadium and it's bouncing with twenty five thousand people, and then if it was away for a couple of games and you go back there and it's empty, it's it's, it's a very strange, strange feeling, strange atmosphere. So it's um it's, it's definitely it was definitely a flat game for us, but we got the job done. Which um, we knew they were going to come and have a crack at us, and we knew we knew they were going to throw everything at it. But um, yeah, we were we were bang on. But we, as I said, we got we got the job done in the second half. We kind of fixed a few little things up and we. I think the quality, quality came to the surface at the end. So, were there any nerves going into the break, being all square? Not nerve. I wasn't nervous. We weren't going to win it, but it was just a bit. We should be a bit, bit, bit more up than this. 
So as coaches, what are you saying to the players at half time? What advice are you giving them? I think in that game, it, it wasn't, you're not going in chasing or screaming at anyone. And Matty was the same, it was, it's probably just reminded them what, what we said we were going to do before the game, what we were slightly off with and just fixing it up. And I think, I think they did that. We, I think we got penalised quite a lot in that, that game early on. Um, was, was a little, I mean, it just put us on the back, <laughs> the back foot. So it was, it's just reminders more than anything. They're not, the speed of the game's not stressing them. The individuals are not stressing them. It's just not quite going our way. So it's more just almost a bit of a reset and get back to job. And uh, like I said, they, 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 they took it on board. They did that. And the majority of the time at half time, they're, they're thinking, I'm saying probably what we want, what we would say anyway. So it's just little, like I said, it's just little reminders. Um, so we're just going to obviously have to speak about the Saints game. So it was obviously really disappointing to lose, but what a great game of rugby league it was. It, it kind of had all the intensity a bit like of a like a state of origin game, didn't it? What were your views on that? Um, yeah, I don't think any, anyone involved with the club's ever going to be kind of satisfied with coming, the, coming away with a loss. Um, and nobody was, but... Um, we, we had conversations after the game and I felt, I still feel like it was a bit of a, a turning point for us going there and um, we've not been, we've not been kind of, since Penrith we've not been like physically, we've not had to be physically bang on and then that game come up we knew it was going to be tough and the lads stepped it up and for me, going, I know even though we lost the game before, <coughs> we went there and we, we physically dominated them, I thought we, we knocked them about in the first half, we knocked them about in that, the 20 minutes um, um, I feel like they've got a couple of, couple of lads what are there on the way down and we've got some lads here on the way up. What was your take on the game, Tommy? Yeah, I think what Locker said there was, was bang on. We spoke about it a lot afterwards. Um, I think yeah, maybe that discipline stuff is mostly one thing we spoke about. Um, we felt we were, we were all, all over them at, at times in that game. We thought we were dominant, we were winning the collision, we're making meters, but we put ourselves on a bit too much pressure with penalties and, and obviously the two symbolings. So they, those two things sort of sort of cost us and that affects you. I think they defended courageous, they, they work really hard, but it affects your attack and you know most probably for me anyway, I thought we, we could have attacked a little bit better that day. But I've got to take into 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 account their circumstances, you know, go to twelve and how much energy that uses for you to stay in the game it, it affects and Boys were incredibly tough. Um, we're all very proud of them, but uh, there's still some lessons in there that we need to we need to learn. So the highlight of the day was that bit of magic by Bevan for the try. Are you claiming anything with that one? <laughs> I don't claim anything Bevan does. <laughs> that yeah. was all Bevan. Yeah, well, you know, like you don't really coach Bevan French, do you? Uh, I don't anyway. I don't. I don't try to tell them too much about rugby. I I just try to keep them happy, really. <laughs> Make sure he's all right. <laughs> Make sure his body feels good. He's a, a, an incredibly instinctive player, I think. I, I know that from playing with him. As long as he's happy, he sees things that a lot of other people don't see. He sees the game a bit different. It's just a, you know, he's what he's blessed with. And you know, I think if you go in there and try and turn him into something he's not, I think you can hinder that. So my approach to Bill French is keep him happy. Make sure he's got his coffees in the morning and then um, <laughs> massage his calves if he needs a little warm and then um, hopefully he goes out and does stuff like that. I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a few ladies in the audience that have been volunteering for that role. Um, so the game was marred by a couple of cards. What were your take on them both? Um, I thought the Tyler one was quite harsh. I thought quite harsh. It didn't look great to look at, but... Yeah, I didn't think it was, I thought it was quite harsh in terms of where the contact was made. And then with the Bernie one, with the way that game's going, you know, I couldn't say much about that. You know, just really what it is. Um, he direct contact with the head. Um, you know, I think everyone's trying to get out of the game and yeah, you just got that one wrong, Bernie. How about you, Sean? Yeah, uh, yes, um, I don't, I didn't even think Tiles was a penalty. I think it's, he's, it's a brace and, Leave with the arms is isn't illegal. He's fine to do it as long as he's not leaving with the elbow, he's, which I don't, I don't think he did. Um, well, I don't think they did afterwards because he he's not had any follow up from it. He got a yellow card, but there was no there was nothing coming out after the game. Um, and yeah, everything around head injuries now. You, you've, if you touch it, you 
you, you've got to be in trouble. The only thing on birdies I thought was he's got he got an E grade E. Um, it's just he could have got from three to five games, and there was no malice in it from him. So why he gets the extra game? I think he'd have been disappointed with him getting three, but I think the lower end of it was was what he should have received. Um, I just it's very difficult for the lads because that that's probably one of the best games of the year, up against Saints game, where the lads are kind of firing into each other, giving everything they got, and slight error, and he's missing three games and seven hundred and fifty quid lighter in his pocket. So it's it's. He's selling. He's, on one hand, he's, he's selling the best of our sport, uh, and on the other hand, he's, he's getting slapped on the farm for doing it. Yeah, it's quite frustrating, isn't it? So, just speaking of the two of you as individuals, so we all know about your playing careers, but it would be nice to find out a little bit more about the two of you as people. So, there are lots of parallels between you. You've both captain Wigan. You've both represented and captained your country. Uh, you've both had long decorated careers. You're both current coaches. You both have grand final winning brother-in-laws. <laughs> so, <laughs> rugby league is ingrained in both your families. And both your dads played against Wigan in Challenge Cup finals. So Sean, your dad Kieran played for Witness in the 1984 Challenge Cup final, beating Wigan 19 points to 6. And Tommy, your dad James played for Hull FC in the 1985 Challenge Cup final, scoring two tries but ended up on the losing side as Wigan claimed the victory 28-24. And to this day, it's still celebrated in one of the classic finals. So, we're going to start with you, Tommy. <laughs> How old were you when you started playing rugby league? Um, like, for an actual club, like, properly, it would have been about eight, I reckon. Eight or nine, maybe. I, don't, I didn't really play. I played in the backyard with my cousins and that, but I, I didn't actually play for a team until I was a bit later. So you started playing for a team when you were about eight. So tell us about eight-year-old Tommy. What was he like? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Well, <laughs> I wasn't the best in the team, I know that. I wasn't the best, I was small. Um, yeah, I don't know, I just enjoyed it. I think it was because my mates were playing, really. But yeah, I... I I was small, I wasn't that good, really, to be honest. So, as we mentioned, you come from a rugby league family. How much of an influence did your dad have on your rugby league career? Yeah, heaps. Um, my old man coached when I was younger too, so I used to just go to trainings with him all the time. If mum would let me and, you know, just be around it. Just hear my uncles talk about rugby. All my cousins played. You know, if you went back to my grandma's and if there was a game on, everyone would be watching it. It was just constant rugby really so it's just been like that for all of my family for, for pretty much all we know really all my uncles played all their mates and spent a lot of our time at, at rugby clubs and watching games so I, I, yeah, I've been, been around it a while. So your brother McGrath, uh, your uncle Philip and your cousin Kylie all played rugby league at top level. What was it like playing against any of them? Yeah it was quite weird. I, I actually, my uncle Philip and my Cousin Carly, I think when I was about 15, my dad was coaching and I actually jumped on and had a game with them. So I played, I played alongside them. They were a bit older than me, but I played alongside them since I was for a long time. And um, yeah, I don't know. I stayed away from Carly and Philip. I didn't go anywhere near them. <laughs> I went after McGrath though. <laughs> um, yeah, so I stayed away from those two. They're a lot older than me, obviously. You know, forwards too, so I didn't, I didn't go to anywhere near them. But, McGrath, whenever we had a, we had a good laugh and we played against each other. So you were playing for London Broncos when Wigan came in for you. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was just, at London. I had signed a one-year deal. I'll be honest with you. I was mostly I was only young at the time. I'd only come to London to get out of a contract that I was was in. So it was a one-year thing, and I liked it. So I stayed for another year, and then I was going to look to go back. But I think when the opportunity come to come to a club like Wigan, I just thought. And I was enjoying my time there and 
I just thought it was a big club, you know, I really enjoyed playing in the Super League and I thought, you know, a you know, chance to come to play, play for a club like this, I had to jump there, so I took it. What can you remember about your first day at Wigan? Hmm, um, where did I go? I got dropped off, I think it was Dean Bell, dropped me off to a house, I stayed out in, what was it, Chorley? I think it was, and I was by myself, I, it was quite lonely to be honest, I didn't know where it was, it was dark. The weather was a little bit different to London too, like, it got dark a lot earlier, so I was like, I didn't really know what to do, so I had a sat nav and I just drive around and try to find where to go, but um, yeah, it was um, different. I had been away from home, I left when I was, when I, leave, I was 19 when I left, so I lived in London by myself, so yeah, I, I was used to it, it was pretty easy. So you made your Wigan debut on a very cold, snowy Friday on the 9th of February 2007 against Warrington in front of a crowd of 21,693. What do you remember about that? Not too much, I don't remember that game. Um, yeah. I honestly don't remember that, I don't... I don't remember that game. Uh, I don't remember, did we win or what? Do you want me to, do you want me to just... You're gonna have to, Jog your memory a little bit. <laughs> right, so a certain Adrian Marley also made his debut that night for Warrington, lasting 47 minutes before he came off second best with Eamon O'Carroll's head. And he spent about six weeks on the sidelines. No, I still don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you sure you didn't come into contact yeah. with Eamon O'Carroll's head? My stomach, I honestly can't remember that game. What was the score? We lost. We did lose, yeah. I, Honestly, I can't remember the score, but I know we did. we did lose. I can't remember that game. Right, we'll see if you can remember this. You were given your international debut in 2003 for New Zealand against Australia by then coach Daniel Anderson, who was also your coach at New Zealand Warriors at the time. What can you remember about that? I remember that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, we won. We won. I remember my first game. Um, I just, I was my first year playing. I remember I actually played for the Junior Kiwis before that. Um, I played some NRL games during the year, went back and played Junior Kiwis. And I was looking forward to having a break and hanging out with my mates, really. And then um, Stacey Jones got injured and so did Lance Ohio. So Daniel rang me up and said, after that game, you're coming up and playing for the top team. So I was just turned 18, I think at the time, I was young. I, don't, I played about six games in NRL, so I, I knew a lot of the Warrior players, but I just remember it being a great game. Um, it was a centenary test, I think it was. It was at North Harbour Stadium. Um, we ended up winning. So it was a, yeah, a massive game. Um, people still talk about it now. I think um, Clinton Tupi scored three tries. So I remember that game a lot more than the women one. So. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> right, so your dad was assistant coach of New Zealand at that time. I bet that was a very proud moment for him. Yeah, it was. He, had, he had, there was a couple of ex Kiwis. I think him and Gary Kimball and Tony Kent were involved. And my dad didn't say too much. He never does. So um, yeah, it was quite. It wasn't too awkward for myself, really. He doesn't. He doesn't say too much. He's quite quiet. So he was involved, and yeah, I just it was, it was a cool. I suppose he, he didn't tell me he was proud, but I'm, I'm guessing he was. <laughs> so you went on to win Rookie of the Year. What can you tell us about that? Um, I don't know, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> How did it feel? How did it feel? Um, yeah, well, at that time, it happened so quickly for me at the start of my career. It just sort of happened, really. I didn't pay too much. I was really young, so I was 17. I had just come out of, I was still at school when I got my debut, so I had to leave school, really, to start playing rugby league. And then it just happened so quickly, and it sort of come really quick. And at the end of that year, played Kiwis, and then obviously won Rookie of the Year. So it all comes quickly. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily enjoy those individual accolades too much. I just try to get it done and get out of there and, and try um, get back to the team. So I, yeah, I don't really look forward to those things. But looking back on it, you know, really proud to, to, have, to have done that. So there's talk of an NRL expansion and rumours of a potential second club in New Zealand, either Wellington or Christchurch. What's your views on that? Do you think it's a positive step? Yeah, I do. I think they could handle it really easily too. If you look at the competition in the NRL, 
Pacific Islanders make up, I think, 50% of the competition. So, you know, if you go to Auckland at the moment during the year, every single NRL team will have a camp and they'll be taking players. So we definitely can handle it. I think it'll be great for our game in New Zealand. And um, yeah, I don't know whether Wellington or Christchurch is the best place to do it. I'm not too sure. But I, I think we could handle that easy with the amount of talent we've got in New Zealand. You know, I'd love to see more of them playing in the NRL. So, if it did happen, do you think New Zealand Warriors should resort back to being called Auckland Warriors? Not sure. Um, yeah, maybe if they do that, it makes sense. If there's two teams here, they should go back to the Auckland Warriors, but um, no, they're doing really well this season. I, I, like I said, I'd, I'd love to see another team in New Zealand um, in the NRL. I think it would be great. So, you went on to have a very successful international career, spanning just short of 20 years, including that amazing World Cup win in 2008. Tell us what your memories of that are. Yeah, that was a great day, great day for the for the country, really, New Zealand Rugby League. Um, yeah, we just ridden off. And to be fair, we it's most what we wanted. I reckon we, we lost to them by about thirty points in the first game of the, the tournament. They absolutely smashed us. So no one thought we were gonna win and I suppose luckily for us we sort of thought we had a chance and yeah, it was just a great game to be part of. Um, sold out Sun Court. Um, against Australia. They had an awesome team too. I remember thinking about the team they had. It was just some great players. Billy Slater, Cameron Smith, Jonathan First, and Darren Lockyer. And we had myself, so... <laughs> we weren't favourites, that's for sure. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of us young guys. Isaac Luke was young at the time. Greg Eastwood, I think, there. You know, we, if you looked at the two squads, you, there was only really going to be one winner, but we managed to do it. So, what are your highlights at Wigan, firstly as a player and now as a coach? Um, the first one that sticks out to me is the 2010 Grand Final. Um, I just think, because we had been so close for so long, we'd all played together for a long time. Um, yeah, it just was special to get finally across the line. I think that one stands out. Um, and then the Challenge Cup the next year, I remember that. Purely because of the run we had, we, I think we played all the top teams going into it. I know we had Warrington, Saints. Um, I just remember it being such a hard road to get there. And we put a lot of focus after we won the grand final. We, we sort of put a lot of focus on that. And to win that one the year after that was special. So, you know, those two. And then I reckon all, all the games against St. Helens, you know, I think back to the atmosphere. You know, I got told when I got here, these you know, Good Friday games are special. And, you know, you, you, you know, should look forward to them. And, it went wrong. The, the atmosphere that you guys create, the town creates, is, is amazing. It's a special game to be part of, and yeah, I really enjoyed all of those, all of those games. Um, and then as coaching, um, coaching, Jesus, um, pretty similar, really. I really enjoyed the last Good Friday out here. I think we had we had um, a few players out. And we played really just you know, for me to be a part of that as a coach, and yeah, we had. Shot playing in the halves. I remember, I remember that game, and I just remember coming away from that. That was a cool experience. And then, obviously, the grand final. I think the build up to win the, the last game of the year and you're in the grand final is special as a player or as a coach. And it's just all the work that everyone's done throughout the year. You know, you sort of work really hard, and to get that last result, you know, um, that was special. If you could go back to 2003, what advice would you give yourself? Nothing we are. I don't know. You're mostly always going to say enjoy it more. Enjoy it more, most probably. I think you get to a stage, especially when you're young at that time, it, it all seems intense and it's so important to you and you're, you're working hard to try and you know, make teams and play in the NRL or play in the Super League. But then ultimately, I think when you get to the back end of your career, you just, you just enjoy the game. I enjoy the game. I think my last couple of years of playing, it was just about playing rugby, really. It was just I really enjoyed playing. So I think... You never, it never will happen though because you're so young at the time and you're trying to chase things. You have to go through that development stage, but I feel like the sooner you can just go out there and just pretty much enjoy playing rugby, what you did before you started being professional, and I feel like towards the back end of my career, I really enjoyed that. And if I could yeah, tell myself, yeah, just enjoy it. It's going to be ups and downs, just enjoy the ride. You're well known for your tough tackling and your concrete shoulders. <laughs> Who's the toughest tackler that you've encountered? Let's take it. Um, there's a few. Who did I say? Um, 
And then next week, and he's a pretty strong tackler. So, I'm lucky I don't have to play it, but against him too many times. Um, I can think of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Cool. Oh, yeah. Papua New Guinea. Any Papua New Guinea team. I remember my first time I played them. I think she, Wayne Bennett was our coach for the Kiwis in the World Cup. And he made us do a boxing class, like just randomly a boxing class in the middle of the week. I'm like, why are we doing this? And when you got to the game, you understood why you're doing it, mate. It was. <laughs> He's like the smallest guy on the team. I mean, he was a hooker. He hit, yeah, and we had Jared while we were high graves. His first carry of the game, and Jared's sort of like running, and he thought, I'll pick this guy up. And he went straight, and honestly, he just flew into him. Jared lost the ball, and I was thinking, Jesus, that's the smallest guy on the team doing it to our biggest guy. I was going for a long day, so. You, you could actually be describing yourself, though. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But this guy was a lot smaller than me. Man, he was tiny, and he just, he just fearless, too. They're fearless, like, it's like nothing could hurt them. You put, you know, you put a big shot on one of them and they're just, it's like nothing, I was just like, no. That's you. <laughs> so, I'm really hoping that you can remember this, but can you please talk us through that tackle that you did on Murray Farsavalu? Yeah, I remember that, um, I just got, I don't, honestly, you just got a little bit lucky, really, because he bobbled the ball a bit, so he wasn't really looking, so... I just thought I might as well go here. <laughs> so, yeah. You always, as a smaller guy, you always don't want to let them get a, a run up at you, so you want to try to get at them before they get you, really. That was my mentality. And um, yeah, when he bobbled the ball, I thought, hey, this is, I have to go now. <laughs> um, what was your first impression of lockers, and how has that changed today? <laughs> it hasn't really changed too much. He's always been. We were honest, genuine bloke. But yeah, I, I knew Lock was a good player before. I'd played alongside him. I always thought he was a fantastic player. Very gifted in the sense that he could he could play like a half, but then he could get through a lot of work like a middle. And then he could kick the ball if you needed him to. Um, he was dead fit too, he could play long minutes. So he was pretty much, he could do a lot of things. He could do a lot of aspects of the game really, really well. My best way to explain it, and you don't really get that too often. And then off the field, he's class, humble, family man, and we're quite similar. We both like a beer, so we get on quite well. <laughs> so you played your final game against Leeds in the playoff in uh, September 2022. How did it feel when the realization hit that that was that was your last game? Yeah, I was alright. I was alright with that. I knew, I knew going into it, I think I made my decision during the year. I was, like Locker said, for a couple of years going into it, I, I sort of knew that, you know, this could be the last. And yeah, I wasn't, I was fine with it. I was kind of lost, but it's the way life is, you know. And I was just, yeah, I'll, when you know you're ready to finish, I'm, I'm quite lucky that I got to that stage. I, I would be gutted if I still wanted to play and I couldn't play or injuries or anything like that. So I was just felt really great for us, similar to Locker's. We got, chance to make our decision on when we want to finish and to finish at this club in that game you can't pick out the result ends up but I was ready by then to finish. Thank you Tommy. So we're going to move on to you now Sean. This is your life. <laughs> so tell us, tell us about your childhood. How old were you when you started playing rugby league? I was nine, I reckon. Um, circuit out in the road. Well, the old circuit out one before that. Uh, Dave Mallon, he, he got me into rugby. I think even though I, my brother played, my, my dad played, I, I weren't that interested in it until, until lads started playing at school. I didn't really watch it. Um, and then, yeah, probably nine. Started playing at school and joined, joined the club what most of the lads at school played at. So I, I know we've all heard you talk fondly about Dave Mallin. Was he your teacher, coach? Uh, he was. He was my school teacher. Uh, he took the rugby team, but he was also he did the town teams at that time. So what influence did he have on you? Um, he, he obviously coached the rugby, but he was just a good teacher. Yeah, I think you remember teachers from when you were in school, no matter what they taught you. I think he was just a good teacher, very um, good fun, but had a, a very like discipline side to him as well. Um, I think when you look with the, if you think back to teachers, what you like, but you know they were disciplined, they're normally pretty good teachers. Uh, like this can still, 
still tell you off when they need to, but I think you can still come away from school out with a lot of respect from the public and very good teachers. What can you remember about your first day at Wigan? Um, not a lot. I can it kind of all put into one because I, I kind of, from leaving school I was in the academy, then I went to reserves, then it went to first team kind of year by year. Um, I think one, one thing for me what made it probably easier going into first team environment was the fact that I knew quite a few of them. Uh, obviously, um, with Slaz being my brother-in-law, I was at barbecues when I was like 12, 15, seeing all first team was pissed, so... <laughs> <laughs> I was quite comfortable around them. Uh, I, knew, I, knew quite, I knew quite a lot of them. Um, so they, and they probably leaked out for me a little bit more than they, they did some of the other lads. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't as daunting as probably what it was for some of the other lads what were stepping in there. So what was it like having your brother-in-law as your captain? Did he look after you? Um, not really. I think he didn't, I didn't get any special treatment, no. Um, uh, probably that was the, the biggest benefit, having probably that familiarity with some of the other lads before I even got there. Um, I, th I think you, you see some of that lads coming here, they're, they're very, it's a very daunting environment, and I think it takes them a while to settle in and to see the, um, the true sides to them, um, quite shy and reserved um, until you get comfortable around people. So that was, I didn't get any special treatment, but I definitely think I was a little bit more comfortable stepping forward when I made that transition. Who was the biggest inspiration in your career? Um, looking back on it, Faz would probably have been one of them without actually um, thinking that at the time. Just probably more stuff that I learned from him before he was before I was even playing the game. Like how, he, how he carried himself away from away from rugby, you know, the professionalism side of it. Um, seeing him, seeing him probably. I remember like when I was younger, seeing like him and Mick Cass and. Uh, Gary Connolly, what's that like, like training in my dad's, dad's shed at home and, and stuff like that. So it's seeing that side of things was it probably be, um, becomes ingrained in you without even knowing it. That kind of work, work ethic, seeing them blocks do it, seeing them flog themselves in pre season, see how I do it, seeing them go on runs, that kind of stuff. Um, blocks like that. And, and then fam, family, family and parents, that would, they, would, they would definitely be number one. So, you made your big debut from the bench against Hull FC on the 5th of April 2002. Again, we went on to win 20 points to 18. What can you remember about that? That's um, very similar to Tommy. <laughs> I remember the, I actually played in a, it was against the same team, it was against Hull, but it was in uh, one of the friendlies before the season. I remember that one, just feeling massively in the depth, playing against Blokes. Um, so at that time, I'd probably played a year of academy, a year of reserves. Well, you, there was some, there was some fellas in there, but it was still a first team game, and then well, in the third season, you straight up against fellas, um, and being a skinny little kid, still a skinny little kid at that time, you just feel like you're deaf. You, f you feel like you can't breathe. Your condition is gone. You feel like you're a ten year old lad wrestling with your dad. Um, sometimes it's just a, you just feel like you're deaf, but then you get another game, you get another game, and you just become accustomed to it, you get used to it, and then your confidence builds off the back of it. So you were made Wigan captain in 2006. What can you remember about that? Um, I, can't rem I remember the, the conversations with um, the Mill Ward about it. Um, it was a bit of a transitional time for the club. I think there's a lot of senior lads left. Um, it, it weren't just Andrew leaving, it was kind of, I think, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of that era of players on, on the way out um, and moving on. Um, so the, the club was a bit... I probably, looking back, I, I wasn't ready to... Not, not not ready, but there wasn't probably a strong enough group around me to do it as well. I think when I, when I think best of the captains, there's blocks like Tommy, uh, Tommy at um, a strong group around me. Um, I think it would have suited me to, to, be, to probably get it a couple of years later, but... I think what Tommy said about it, then you, you, you learn from them experiences and they probably make you better in the long run. So it's, it was um, a tough couple of years doing it. And I think for me, I was just off the back of it. I had the play in 2005, so I, was, I had like a bad knee injury in the start of 2005. So, I, yeah, it was a good Friday game, yeah. you know what? 
<laughs> so one, one hand I'd been giving the captaincy and the other hand I was just trying to play again, just trying to get some form. So it was a bit of a, it was quite a tough time for, for me, but tough time as a, for the, the, the team as well. We weren't, we weren't great. So we had a bit of a barren spell, trophy-wise, up until 2010, when you led the team to grand final victory. What can you tell us about it? And as a player or as a team, could you sense that that was coming? That, that change in, in, obviously, winning silverware? Yeah, I think all from so my time, in, I got in there in 2002, which we won something. We were involved in a couple of finals the following few years, and then it was... It was a couple of semis here and there up until 2010, but we always had good players, we always had good coaches, we just weren't, there was just some, something a little bit missing, and I think when it comes to 2010 and Manchester Duke had, I think there's only Deeks come in. Um, so somebody won a lot uh, at Bradford, so I think he, he kind of, he didn't come in as a, um, a form player or anything like that, he come in as, I think he brought a lot of experience to the side, um, and yeah, I think when Manchester called the work, the work rate went through the roof. But it was it was just a hungry group. Even the even the years we did, we didn't win it, um, there was some wobbles in it. But I always felt that there was there was a, enough players in that that team at, at any one time that we, we could swing things around. And um, you lose people here and there. And but there was a core of players, young lads coming through, like who were hungry for success. And I think I think. When Madge came in, the appointment to that was it just got the best out of all them people. And as I said, not a lot of change, not a lot of change from the, the playing side of things. It was more just an attitude to, towards training and working. So you've captain Wigan to every domestic trophy. Which one is your favourite and why? My, my favourite occasion would be the grand final. Um, I just think that just because that was a smoke weather, the build up to two thousand and ten. For me, never, never lifting a trophy to get my hands on one in 2010 was was a massive relief as much as anything. Um, but then again, I think when you look back, I think um, the World Cup challenge built where even though it probably, that that one didn't probably feel like it at the time, but <laughs> afterwards when you look back, people hey, people talk about it. That was built there as well. So your final game for Wigan was the grand final in 2020. How did it feel playing for the last time after 19 amazing years to do it in front of no crowd, no fans? Um, it, it was it was strange, but I think because we'd done it, so we'd almost got used to it. It didn't. By the time we played the grand final, we we played a lot of games in front of no crowd, then, and it was it was um, it just become normal. The my, my biggest disappointment was that like, the family couldn't be there for it. I had in mind not playing in front of a crowd, but it was more family not being able to come to the game and watch it. That was probably the, the hardest part. They were disappointed not to be there. Kids, misses, parents. Yeah. I know they were, dis they were disappointed not to be able to go to it. But for me, I think even for the team at that time, it didn't feel like it was, wasn't playing in front of a crowd. You just got used to it. So this is just a question for both of you. You've both worked well. Oh, you've both worked with and played under many different coaches. What influences do you take from them into your own coaching style? Um, I think you pick up you pick up little bits from lots of them. Um, one of them is probably their, um, not not specifically their own tactics or tactical stuff. It's probably more just how they make you feel a little bit. Like as in, you're very more open to learn and, and work with somebody who's you feel like has got an eye out for you, um, away from rugby as well. So I think, for me, it's that kind of trying to build a relationship before you start asking them to do something for you or asking them to change something. I think if you can, if you can build that, then you, you can almost, you can ask people to do anything. I think if, they, if you've got an element of kind of uh, caring about them a little bit and make them feel comfortable with you, then you can, you can ask them to do, like ask them to run through brick walls for you. But, you ask them to do that from a position where they've no respect for you, then it's they're not going to do it. What's your take on that, Tommy? Yeah, it's exactly that. Um, yeah, just building that relationship. The best coaches I've had, we've always sort of had that relationship. But I reckon I've learned stuff of coaches on what to do and what not to do. Even the, I would say the coaches that I didn't think were as good as others, mm. I've learned so much of them too. But I think the biggest thing I suppose that I sort of learned is don't try to copy someone, just be yourself, I think. 
I think it wants of the players get a sense that you're not being yourself or you're trying to you're trying too hard to do so. I feel like it's it's just fake. So, Would you ever be interested in taking up coaching on an international level at all? Um, yeah, eventually, if that if that come the opportunity comes, nothing that I've thought about too much really. But um, I went. I really enjoyed my time in the Kiwis. I think it's just a great environment, especially for a Kiwi kid to you know go on and play for the Kiwis. Always loved it. But yeah, if something popped up, especially for them, I you know I'd, I'd be interested. But. Um, yeah, I'm full too much about it. What about you, Sean? You fancy yourself as the next Wayne? Um, I, I, I think it was my second year in it, in the uh, coaching Wigan, and Wayne asked me about getting involved with England, but I was, it got to the end of the year, and we, my head was that pickle, but I just wanted a rest. <laughs> I just wanted a break. The hardest, the hardest thing about doing internationals is you're rolling back into it with Wigan, and you've not had a break. And I think, I didn't want to, I didn't want to come back into Wigan not fresh. So I'd have loved to have done it, but. I almost thought the break would have been more beneficial going. I didn't want to do four weeks, five weeks with England. And then it was pretty, pretty much even started a week or two later with Wigan, but not. And almost like resenting being back in so soon. So I, again, I think now I'm a bit more comfortable with, the, with it and a bit more um, equipped for it. Hopefully down the line I'll get an opportunity to be involved again. Yeah. So Wayne, if you're watching. Um, so... Obviously, in your years at Wigan, we've had so many talented players, and unfortunately, we can't keep them all. How upsetting is it when players have to be let go? And are there any particular ones that you really wanted to retain that you were gutted when we had to let them go? Uh, yeah, you met you, you met good mates with lots of people. Um, I'm trying to think of any in particular now. Um, the, the one probably most recently was when that were most recently when I was the last couple of years I was playing was probably Benny Flower when he when he finished because he I know he didn't want to go um, he probably worked quite where he was a few years before but he wanted to stay he wanted, he wanted to be there but there wasn't there wasn't an opportunity for him to do that so blocks like that who have come from probably outside of Wigan and settled in Wigan kids go to school in Wigan and uh, you know they, 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 they love the club um, for them not seeing them having to having to move on um, I was speaking to Benny, I think they got, they got to Lee after this. And he's just, I was never in it though, he's like, I was still here. And um, it's, um, as, as much as it's a professional sport and you, there's professional decisions made, it's still, uh, you, especially when you're close mates with them as well, you, want them, you just want them to stay. So, Wigan Captaincy, OBE, Lock Loman Whiskey, Sean O'Loughlin Sweet. What's the greatest honour that you've had bestowed on you? That is quite some, quite some list really, isn't it? The only way you could top that is having a pie named after you. <laughs> so you know, a beer, a beer named after me. Have a what, oh, sorry? A beer. A beer. Me and Tommy were talking about doing our own beers. That sounds like a good plan, actually. I'm sure lots of people would be up for buying that. So go on, what's the, what's the greatest honour? A drip mat. A drip mat. A drip mat. You just need the beer to go with it now, Josie. Uh, do you know what, I don't, I don't know. The OBE was pretty special, it was a bit surreal, but it was, it was, a, it was cool to go there and, and experience that. I thought, I think I've said it earlier, I thought it was, someone was pulling the leg when I got it. Um, it was, yeah, it was just a massive shock, a massive shock to get it and there's not, I think, there's not, you don't hear loads of people involved in rugby league getting it as well, so I think it was, I was, I think it's about all, anything you get given like that, you're not going out there looking for it, but to get it, it was, it was definitely a proud moment, but you feel like you're, you're doing a little bit for the sport as well, getting, getting one of those. So, what impact has receiving the OBE had on you? Absolutely nothing. So, you're not, you're not going into Galloway saying, do you know who I am? I thought it would be like a bit of a checklist, what, get off the speeding fans and... Uh, <laughs> nothing. The only, I think the only perk to it is if one of your kids can get married in St Paul's Cathedral or something like that. There's a 10 year waiting list. <laughs> You must get their names down now. 
So, um, just speaking English kids, obviously, um, your lad George is playing in the academy. How's that been for you as a coach and also as a dad? Um, well, I'm not, I'm not, as a coach, I'm not have to coach him, so he's, he's may not be in the odd time and turn with the first team, but um, as a dad, it's just nice to see him do something he enjoys doing, get an opportunity to do it. Um, he, it was, it, it was very kind of, I think because he's been, he's grown up around it, it was very, um, not very bothered about it. So he's seen everybody drunk at barbecues yeah. as well. <laughs> seen Tommy drunk all the time. <laughs> Probably, we'll have to ask him about that Tommy next time he comes here. Yeah. He, he would, he would, so he was he's not been involved with the scholarship or anything like that because I don't I reckon he was only about fifteen before he was he started like, actually trying at it um, because he he always played he always enjoyed it but I don't think he ever saw it as a as not as a future but he was just quite happy just playing it enjoying it and then I think when he saw some of the lads get scholarships and things like that, he was a little bit disappointed. And, he probably just started trying a little bit harder at it and he's, he's doing okay, he's doing okay, let's see how it goes, but it's just nice to see him do something that he enjoys doing, he's, he's working away from here as well, he's doing something what he enjoys there, and it's just good to see him progress and grow up. Well, he's, he's been here a couple of times and he is, he's a great lad, he's done you proud. Um, so, you've both recently dabbled in a bit of rugby union. How did that come about and what can you tell us about it? Well, I think I'd been asked, my cousin, he's got some involvement up at, with the Rubini Club and uh, Tommy's got a couple of mates up there down there. So when, he'd asked me a few years before, but then when Tommy finished, I thought, I'll, I'll play like, well, Tommy's playing, I'll play. Uh, <laughs> but when, when he agreed, I, I thought I'd agreed to play for Vets. Um, so we were just going thinking we'd have a kick about it, have a, have a laugh, and then a few beers after it. And next minute it was... The, it was like so late. Right? Um, we were playing, we were playing for the first team. And it was a big game on. There was about 3,000 people there. Like, we didn't sign up for this. We were just, it was. Um, yeah, Tommy, he's got a sort of blind um, Yeah, you know, if, if it had been a bit more of a laugh and a, and a joke, we'd have probably gone back, but it was, it was a bit too full on, a bit too serious. <laughs> so. This is a question to both of you. What does the Riversiders mean to you? Um, I think, for me, I've grown up from seeing it, what it does with the academy as much as I've seen what it does with the first team and, and how it supports top to bottom of the club. Um, so it just represents, you go out there every week and you, you see whether it's 10, 20,000 people, whatever it is, you see, you see bums on seats, but I think this almost, you get the familiarity of people here, you know, you know individuals, you know individuals' families, and I think it makes, it almost makes what we see on a game day in the, in the stadium, um, real life when we come here and see the people behind it, and it's just, there's just a massive kind of, um, what's the word, you, you pray to play for the club, but you pray to represent your family, you pray to represent the fans, and I think the Riverside has represent the fans and what, what they're about. Tommy? Um, yeah, for me, I suppose it's your guys' commitment to the club, I suppose that's what strikes me every time I've been invited here and I see a lot of the same faces a lot of the times and your commitment to, and the enjoyment you get from, from, I suppose, the team playing and being part of that is something that strikes me and I suppose you then for feel a bit, not a bit, you feel we feel you need to do your part, you need to do your part. So when I was a player here and I see you guys come and how much you enjoy watching you play, you feel like, you know, I need to do my part here. So, and similar as a coach now, you know, the equipment you show, the support you give to the team, you know, that we have to do our bit and make sure we're putting that same sort of commitment. So we're just going to quickly look forward to the upcoming games. So. Tommy, when you've got the mic, I'm going to ask you, obviously we've got Lee tomorrow evening. There's a few ex-Wigan players wearing the leopard print. Uh, Yumaila Hindley seems to be doing really well, has taken his chance. What can we expect from that game? Yeah, a tough game. Short turnaround after a very intense Good Friday, so we've been quite light in terms of training. But I think what also is a little bit of, we're also proud of our our performance against Saints, but we're 
obviously disappointing with the results. So I think a few boys are achieving to get back out there and get back into winning ways. So sometimes, you know, getting straight into a game or a quick turnaround can be good for that. And then about Yamala there, I think he's having a fantastic period, I suppose, in the last three or four games. Um, you know, I'm really happy for him. He's, he's been at the club for seeing him come through as a young kid. And, you know, it's good to see him get a shot and get a, a run of games and then and show what he can do. So, who do you think is the danger man for Lee Leopards? Uh, it's Lamb for me. I think he's um, a fantastic player. Um, we are talking Lachlan, not Adrian. Yeah, Lachlan. <laughs> Lachlan. Um, yeah, I think he's a really good player. Um, one we have to um, watch. Um, obviously, Lamby was close to getting him here, I think, when he was here. So, yeah, look, he's a very talented guy, um, great skills. But I also think um, his other half's partner has helped him out a lot this year, Matt Moylan. Um, it's a tough place to go, and I think, um, I know Joe Westerman's the older, older end of his career now, but he still has a massive impact on what I do. I think if you can, if you can keep him quiet around that middle, the way he plays, he links their halves up a lot. So if you can keep him quiet, do a job on him, um, you can generally do, do the job on the edges. But it's going to be tough, it's going to be really tough. Um, We'll not even think about the, the, the game following it. It'll be all about that week going into into the Challenge Cup and getting that getting that job done. But um, it's yeah, I, I, I definitely see it being a tricky one. It's not going to be one we're going we're going underestimating. We'll we'll get this league game done and then we'll be we've got a decent turnaround. But I think the lads will get the weekend off, um, bit of time freshen up, and I think we're back in on I think it's bit of Monday off, so we're back in on Tuesday. Mm. So it's. An opportunity to freshen them up, but then when they get in, it's it'll be back to work and, and prepping for that. And I think probably probably maybe not the cast game, but the week after that, we'll, we'll probably there's a few boys in in the mix there for returning from injuries as well, so we get a few numbers back as well. So we're ever ever expecting is it Ethan back? Yeah, I think Ethan Coops. He's the guy who's the largest fullback on centre. Icky. 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 He, he, was, he was big for him. I think um, Thomas Walker went in moving to, to, um, to centre. I think the first few rounds he was a fullback but didn't, didn't perform massively well there. Uh, see the change in him in the centre. He looks a lot more dangerous. So yeah, they're, they're, um, they, are, they are a class team. They are, I think um, uh, Willie Peters has gone, gone ticking pretty well. But I, I do see him getting better as well. I don't feel like they've hit the straps yet. I feel like they'll. And improve, especially as the weather gets dry. I think a lot of the way a lot of the teams will attack will start to change now. Well, hopefully, when if it stays dry. Right. So we're just going to finish um, with a little quiz. So Tommy, we've got a little quiz for you, and it's Kiwis who played for Wigan. Are you ready? Question number one. Which famous Kiwi played 185 times for Wigan, scoring 126 tries and seven goals between 1908 and 1913? I said famous. Kiwi, 1908 to 1913. This is Lance. I wouldn't have a clue. This is too before my time. I thought I'd go right at this too. It's Lance Todd. We'll see if you do better on this one. Question number two. Which Kiwi... No help on this one. Which Kiwi moved to England in 1987 with both St Helens and Wigan claiming to have secured his signature? No help, please, Mr. O'Loughlin. Um, he would be. 
Would it be well that would have been like the Grand West? Nah, he's been here before that, eh? He's seven. So did he play for Wigan? Or did he play for St. Helens? That's not the question. <laughs> Before that, Dean Bell. Um, Henry Paul? No. It was Adrian Shelford. He did, he actually went on to play for Wigan after the High Court ruled that he had not entered into a binding commitment to play for Saints. Smart lad. Right. Number three, and I actually thought I was being a bit of a smarty pants with this one, but I think you're actually going to nail this one. Which player made his international debut for the Kiwis in the 100th international game? It was me. It was you? <laughs> Question number four. Which Kiwi won the Lance Todd Trophy in 1993 Challenge Cup final, win over Witness? Dean Bell? It was, it was Dean Bell. So your final question, and you should get this. On the 2nd of May, 2003, you became the youngest player to debut for the New Zealand Warriors. In the same game, another player became the oldest player to debut for them. What was his name? Was it Carl Tomato? For the Warriors, for us. Vinnie Anderson. <laughs> you give him? His name was Mark Robinson. That's right, the halfback. He played yeah. hooker, and that was the one and only game he ever played for them. He actually went on to sign for Northampton Saints Rugby Union team the following year. He come from rugby that year, I remember that. And, um, I don't remember the same game as me, but he wasn't too good. <laughs> That's why I can't remember. Right, Sean. You're up. I don't mind be easy or not. <laughs> so yours are all about the number 13. Rugby, I just, in general. The, the number 13. And it's all Wigan related. Okay, so question number one. Which player was the 13th player to win the Man of Steel? No. I can. I don't know how long it's been going. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a clue. The year was 1987. It's not, you don't have to be a number 13 who's won it. No. Ellery Angley. It was Ellery Angley. <laughs> Coincidentally, it was a number 13. But he won it in 1987, that was for the second time. He also won it in 1985 and 1989. Question number two. What year was the last grand final held on the 13th of October? What are you asking for a year? Um, of course. 2013. It was 2018 and it was Wigan against Warrington. 
Question number three. Which player was inducted into Wigan's Hall of Fame on the 13th of May, 2016? No idea. It was Fran Obotica. <laughs> that was actually a question that meant for you. And then I switched it. Question number four. 2010 was the 13th official Super League Grand Final. But can you name the player who scored a try 13 minutes into the second half. <laughs> yeah, that was in the first half. Wasn't it? it was Sam Tompkins. <laughs> So I'm gonna f I'm gonna give you an easy one to finish. In what game did you score your thirteenth try for Wigan? Who <laughs> against? What? Sorry. As in who against? In what game? So what game was it? <laughs> the year was two thousand and four. No. Leeds. Incorrect. Salford. It was Salford. It was the 7th of March 2004 and it was a 20 points to 10 win against Salford and you actually scored two tries that day. Right, so thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Give your brains a bit of a workout. Yeah, thank you. Tricky questions. So obviously we're going to ask you to pull out some raffle winning numbers and also something for the the cherry and whites as well. So Mike's going to come up with the the bucket. Thank you.